Shame on you, foolish African. How dare you? 70 years of independence, and you are buying petrol, and that you produce petroleum. If we have the economies of scale, we'll be able to benefit and produce diesel, produce oil, uh, petrol. Iron is still class and so on. Why we need to do this? The major argument given against beneficiaries is that we don't have the critical mass. We don't have the market. We don't have the technology. We don't have the money. When you pull our resources together, the money will be there and we'll be able to, the market will be there. So by coming up with these regional clusters, we'll be able to enable value addition in these clusters. As engineers, the mindset we should have is about Africa, about the African infrastructure master plan, the railways, telecom, telecommunication, power. You can see the scale we're talking about here now. And as engineers, let us be this African who speaks on behalf of 1.3 billion people in a GDP of $2.3 trillion. Yes, welcome kings and queens, that is Professor uh, Mutambala talking about the importance of engineers in the continent of Africa. So it is a little sad to say that uh, their contribution is not uh, great as we're expecting because we see maybe we say about the political issues, the budgets and the other stuff, but we still need to see the great contribution of our engineer. So before I proceed with this great speech, look at this bridge uh, and ask where is our engineers. Look how indigenous and African people who are not engineers are trying to do something. You see, this is like a flyover. So if we have engineers, we can mobilize our resources. We can do great things. But let us stop here. Let us listen what Professor is saying to us, the people of Africa. Africans must be thought leaders. Engineers must be thought leaders. What is a thought leader? What is thought leadership? Intellectual influence through innovative and pioneering thinking. Are you influencing events and progress through innovation, through pioneering thinking, through research, through patents? Are your ideas having impact on society, impact on the economy, impact on the quality of life of the African? That is what we mean by thought leadership, the impact of ideas. But you see, it's not easy. The problem we have is that those with ideas have no power, and those with power have no ideas. <laughs> with your ideas and your lab work, you have no political power, and those with political power have zero ideas. <laughs> so what we need to do somehow is to get a marriage between ideas and power. That's why I was Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> trying to run a country. <laughs> it's important that the ideas we generate find way to those with the political muscle, to those who make decisions. There has to be a marriage between ideas and power. What is thought leadership? Initiatives that seek to turn strategic thinking into reality through execution, through doing, more importantly, through the speed of that execution. Initiatives, activities that seek to turn strategic thinking into reality through execution. Africans must be thought leaders. Engineers must be thought leaders. What do we mean? Knowledge production, knowledge ownership. Are we producing knowledge? Do we own knowledge? Are we producing intellectual property? Do we own intellectual property? Or are we just passive consumers of knowledge? 
as Africans, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired of being consumers of knowledge. We want to be participants in the construction of knowledge, participants in the creation of knowledge, the creation of intellectual property. That's what we mean by thought leadership. They always tell you, well, we don't have critical mass, we can't benefit it because we're too small. Can you imagine if we had to open our eyes and have a diamond cluster where Botswana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Angola work as one unit? We pull our diamond resources together. Can you, we'll be number one in the world in terms of diamonds. Can you imagine if we discuss with the world about diamonds together as one field and say we are the African diamond cluster? We have Botswana in here, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Angola. You can imagine the leverage we are going to have. We can benefit it because now we have the scale that they say we don't have. Platinum. Between Zimbabwe and South Africa, we have 90%, if not 95% of world platinum. They tell us you can't build a plant to produce catalytic converters because we have no scale. When we put Zimbabwe and South Africa together, we can produce the catalytic converters in this region and sell to Japan, sell to America, sell to China, sell to India. Scale is coming from collaboration, and engineering is key in those clusters. Mining engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical, in the diamond cluster, in the platinum cluster. All cluster, Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, and Niger, whichever countries are there, they have a cluster on oil. They will compete with the Middle East. They will compete with everyone else, and they can then beneficiate and produce diesel and petrol, as opposed to Nigeria buying petrol, Nigeria buying diesel. These will be professors who are experts in your field. They're asking you, in your thesis, what's new? Where are you extending the frontiers of knowledge? And you better be knowing your contribution, otherwise you'll be in trouble. So let us extend the frontiers of knowledge. At UJ, at WITS, at the University of Zambia, how many patents are we producing? How many companies are being produced from the UJ engineering faculty? How many businesses are coming out of the university? How many industries are being created because of your research? That's what we mean by thought leadership. That's what we take Africa to the promised land. Job creation. Business creation, in addition to creating workers, let us create entrepreneurs, let us create job creators. Education must be a means to an end, not an end in itself. Bill Gates, you know, when I went to Davos one time, I met up with Bill Gates. I was very curious. And I said, Bill. <laughs> I was looking at your biography. I understand you are studying physics at Harvard, and you dropped out in your second year. How dare you do that? If I did that in my own country, the entire village would stone me. They say, how dare you, Mutambara, you get a chance to go to Oxford and you drop out to form a company? And then he said, no, look, uh, it wasn't very risky. It was a strategic decision. If I waited, I would, have, I would have formed Microsoft, so I had to go. But however, I cut a deal with my professors. They allowed me to go and form my company. And they said to me, go and form Microsoft, but if you run into trouble, come back. We'll work with you to get you your degree. I was like, wow, I never heard of that before. In my own country, in Africa, at UJ, if you drop out, they chase you. They don't want to see you again. <laughs> They discontinue you. <laughs> so, professors, let us be flexible. Allow the best engineer, the best student in electrical engineer to go out and form a company. If they fail and don't succeed, allow them back. <laughs> Work with them and get them that degree. <laughs> Entrepreneurship is time sensitive. If Bill Gates had waited to get his physics degree, Maybe by the time he was trying to do Microsoft, somebody else would have done it. He had to leave Harvard. Top student in physics, he left Harvard, and the rest is history. 
extending the frontiers of knowledge. Many patents from Bill Gates, many companies based on Bill Gates, many businesses. The same applies to Steve Jobs, same applies to Mark Zuckerberg. Education must be a means to an end, not an end in itself. But you must get your degree. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this is what we're saying. That's the framework now. The future of Africa. Three major pillars. The key driver is going to be technology. You engineers, you technologists are a key pillar in achieving the promised land in Africa. The fourth industrial revolution is a major pillar in driving the African continent. Continental integration is another major pillar of the African dream, decolonized thought leadership. Get that? Thought leadership alone is not enough. It must be decolonized. Decolonized thought leadership is a major driver towards the African dream, the African promised land. Those are the three pillars. Let me dramatize their importance. You all know that for us to succeed as Africans, we must beneficiate, we must add value. We can't be selling raw copper, raw diamonds, and raw gold. We must be selling catalytic converters from our platinum. We must be selling rings from our diamonds, jewelry from our diamonds. We must be producing cars and producing computers, producing planes. Now, you can't do that if you are not decolonized. You can't do that if you don't have the confidence as an African. The African engineer must have self-belief, must have confidence that I can design a computer. I, as an African, can design a car. I, as an African, I can design a plane. But more importantly, I can build it. I'm not talking about assembling. Assembling Mercedes-Benz assembling BMW, assembling Toyota. No, designing the Ubuntu computer, designing the Ubuntu car, the UJ aeroplane. <laughs> if you don't have a decolonized mind, you can't think like that. You're like, no, 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 UJ can't do this. That's for MIT. UJ can't do That's for Caltech. UJ can't, that's for London School of Economics. That's for Imperial College because you have no confidence. Self-confidence tells you, if Bill Gates can do it, I can do it as well. Design software, build software, design a car. So the engineer himself, the curriculum you have must empower you to design a plan. Does it? Or the assumption is the plane will come from Japan who maintain the plane. <laughs> the car will come from Japan who maintain the car. We want to design the car. We want to build the car. A decolonized curricula will allow you to do that. Decolonized entrepreneurial spirits. And the African government must be decolonized as well. Does the government have confidence in its own engineers? The private sector must be decolonized. Are they putting money into manufacturing cars? So decolonization is important in the university, in the private sector, in government. Do you have confidence in local designs? Do you have confidence in local manufacturing? Aha, uh -huh, the consumer. Let's come to you, the consumer. When the... <laughs> TV says, made in Mpumalanga <laughs> by a UJ student. Are you going to buy that TV? <laughs> when it says, made in Dotito in Cholocho, you like Sony, you like Philip, you like Samsung, you like LG. You are a victim of colonial mentality. You are a victim of mental slavery. Why can't you support your own product?
Made in Dotito, buy made in Dotito. Made in Cholocho, buy made in Cholocho. Made in Kumasi, buy made in Kumasi. Guess what, guys and ladies? Japan after the Second World War, Toyota was horrible. Nissan was, it was like Zhijong. No one wanted to touch Toyota. No one wanted to touch Honda or Mitsubishi. But the Japanese had self-confidence said, oh, we'll buy our own products. They bought Toyota. In Europe, in Africa, people were buying Mercedes-Benz, were buying European cars. No one would touch a Japanese product. But over time, starting with the local market of the Japanese, Asian market, Toyota, Sony, Mitsubishi, Honda became the brands by being supported by their own people. So the Ubuntu car, the Ubuntu cell phone, the UJ aeroplane eventually will become a superstar brand if you support it. The African consumer must have confidence in local products. Remember, I'm emphasizing those three pillars, technology and the decolonized thought leadership. Now, the third one, market size. Now, normally when there's, no, 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 you can't produce cars, there's no market for it. No, 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 you, you can't produce this. Guess what? If we work together as Africans, 1.3 billion Africans, and 10% of those support your car, surely you'll be able to, to, to make it. So the African continent being a market, and I'll talk about that later on, will solve the issue of markets. So we need the market, we need the uh, confidence, and we need the technology. The engineer. Now, engineers, please don't feel constrained. The sky is the limit. Yes, you must work as engineers, civil engineers, mechanical, electrical, and so on. Work in the profession, but don't feel limited to the profession. Go into academic leadership. Marwala is here running the university. And the minister was saying there are only two vice chancellors or engineers in the whole country. How come? When you're in high school, you're the number one student, getting all the good marks. You go into engineering, the less not so able chap or woman goes and do law or history, then they become the vice chancellor. They, they run you. How can people who are not smart? <laughs> If I, was, if, I, if I was better than you at all level, at matric, if I was better than you in English, in Zulu, in maths, and at, at, at matric, why are you in charge of me now as a history major, as an English major, as a lawyer? Engineers must not accept that. Engineers must become vice chancellors, like Barwala. <laughs> Don't feel limited by your profession. The sky is the limit. And by the way, the way I look at it is that um, uh, education is about teaching you how to think. Education is about solving problems. Education is about structured thinking and research. What you do in your life is neither here nor there. As an engineer, you can be a good journalist. As an engineer, you can be a good vice chancellor. You can be a manager. You can be an economist. You can do whatever you want because you are trained to think in a structured manner. You are trained to solve problems. That's why I was a rock star deputy prime minister running a country, <laughs> coming from engineering. Yes, with Robert Mugabe and Morgan Shangrai. We are the three principals, but I was running the show because I was the smartest. <laughs>
don't feel constrained. We're talking about the role of the engineer beyond engineering. The sky is the limit. Don't feel constrained. You can do whatever you want because, you, you, you know, and I'm actually not being boastful, I'm being factual. Think about it this way. I go to school, I do second order differential equation, I do fast Fourier series, and then I can cross over and look at the law, look at the constitution, read, look at the classics, read, look at history and read, and understand it. Take the, the law measure, take the history measure, bring them into control systems. Can they do fast <laughs> Fourier series? Can they do second order differential equations? Can they even read this? I can read the, the constitution. You can read the constitution. So we are in a unique position as engineers to cross over into law, cross over into journalism, cross over into business, cross over into politics. Whereas a major in philosophy, a major in literature, and I love literature, I'm simply saying it's harder for them to cross over into a course on robotics and mechatronics. <laughs> <laughs> to cross over into artificial intelligence. To cross over into nanotechnology. I, 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 I want to see them. It will be harder. They can try. It will be harder. <laughs> so as scientists, as medical doctors, as engineers, as technologists, you have a unique opportunity to do whatever you want with your life, the role of the engineer beyond engineering. Decolonization, let's define it. What we mean, removing the vestiges of colonialism in institutions, in education, in culture, in worldviews, and in thinking. African-centered thinking, as opposed to Eurocentric views, Eurocentric worldviews. Serving African interests as opposed to a Eurocentric agenda. Getting rid of colonization of the mind and mindset in individuals, in institutions, and the curriculum. Decolonizing the mind. Removing institutional racism, institutional bias, institutional colonialism. That's what we mean by decoloniality or decolonization. A liberated way of thinking, knowing, and doing. You see, we are in the academy. We are in academia. We are learning to know things. Are we thinking in a liberated way? Are we knowing in a liberated way? Are we doing in a liberated way? That's decolonization. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, Steve Biko the visionary. The most powerful weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Now, in 1957 in Ghana, we had physical decolonization. In Zimbabwe, decolonization physically. In 1994, physical decolonization. When was your mind decolonized? Don't tell me 1994. How was it done? So decolonizing the mind is a harder activity than taking over power from colonial masters, than freedom we got in 1994, than the independence in 1957, than the independence in 1980 in Zimbabwe. Ngugiwa Thiong, decolonizing the mind. Read that material. It's a harder exercise because it's subtle. It's harder because it's uh, nuanced. It's harder because it's internalized. Huh? It's internalized. It's in our, bar, our, our blood, our mind. So we must realize that 1994 was not decolonization of the economy. It was decolonization of the political structure. And some people are very cynical. They even say that uh, in 1994, what they did was uh, they gave us the crown and kept the jewels. You get a crown without the jewels. The jewels are still with white monopoly capital. That's what we mean by decolonization. What are the areas, Professor? We need to look at theory and practice in engineering, in mechanical, in civil, and decolonize that theory, decolonize the practice, the language. You know, Professor Marwala did a very interesting article in the Sunday Times where he was talking about discrimination in the fourth industrial revolution. When you say Siri, 
<laughs> what language is Siri speaking on your phone? When you say Siri, what accent does Siri has? And when you do voice recognition, face recognition, what faces are there? White faces, European accents, European languages. So there's discrimination currently in the fourth industrial revolution. So let us decolonize the language. I know there's no word for electron or proton or neutron in Zulu <laughs> or in Shona. <laughs> We got to start somewhere. The Japanese and the Chinese are working on this. Swahili, I think, has made some progress. We, we got to work on this because language is called the power to define. The power to define. So the language must be decolonized. The academics must be de pedagogy must be decolonized. Language of instruction, pedagogy, teaching, the learning process, and theory must be investigated. Authorities must take responsibility and engage the subject. By pedagogy, you are simply saying the method of teaching, the practice of teaching, in particular as an academic subject or theoretical concept. It's going to be harder than decolonizing classics, history, and sociology. This is, these are equations now. This, <laughs> Laplace transforms. <laughs> eh? Third order differential equations. First Fourier series. How are you going to decolonize them? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to the able professor here to do that. <laughs> so we, we, we are, we're not doing enough. We've got to do a lot. Contextual relevance. What are examples are you using in your class when you're teaching control systems, when you're teaching civil engineering? Huh? We need curriculum change. Decolonizing the engineering curriculum is an imperative. Okay? We move on to the big issue of integration. When we train our engineers, when we practice our engineering, let us think about regional frameworks, continental frameworks. South Africa is too small a framework. Think about SADAC. Think about continental integration, COMESA, East African community, ECOWAS, Maghrib, the African Union. The tripartite free trade area, that's COMESA, EAC, and SADAC. The African Continental of Free Trade Area, which was signed into, into being on the 21st of March last month, or 2018, by AU members. When we say we're teaching engineering, let's teach our students within the African context, not South African context, but the broader Pan-African context, the broader African agenda. Why? Because this will give you the scale you need for your project, the scale you need for impact, the scale you need for your products. Regional and continental intersection plans, you know, do we know as engineers, as professors, the intersection strategy for SADAC? What are we picking up from? What are the elements in that plan? The SADAC infrastructure master plan, the AU agenda 2063. In these projects, there's a lot of engineering, a lot of infrastructure work, and we as engineers must be taking our examples, our models from the Pan-African framework. We are now talking about what we call regional competitiveness as opposed to national competitiveness. Regional attractiveness as opposed to national attractiveness. South Africa won't be attractive if Zimbabwe is unattractive. Because numbers, an investor in China, an investor in Japan, if they're coming to the region, they would want a larger market. They will look at Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Malawi. And so the region must be competitive. The region must be attractive. Continental attractiveness. Where are we as engineers in terms of our programs, in terms of targeting infrastructure? Infrastructure is very important because it's a key enabler. That's water, that's electricity, that's ICT, that's public works. Seek first the kingdom of infrastructure and the rest will follow. <laughs> and who is there? Who is the infrastructure? The engineer. Infrastructure is a key enabler for all our activities. Let me look at the numbers to dramatize what I'm saying. Zimbabwe, GDP 12 billion. A population of 30 million. Meaningless. South Africa, 55 million people, a GDP, 300 billion. Chicken change. <laughs> Under globalization, this is nothing. I hope South Africans are listening. You cannot be a brick 
You're too small to be a brick in the bricks. You must bring SADAC, bring COMESA, bring the FTA area, bring Africa into the bricks. Then it makes sense to the Chinese and the Russians and the Indians. Botswana, 2.3 million people and a GDP of 16 billion dollars. This is meaningless under globalization. As engineers, you understand these are not economies. These are Mickey Mouse economies, useless economies. Where are the economies? That's an economy now, SADAC. 280 million people, GDP, $600 billion. Now we are talking. Now you can discuss with China. You can talk to India, talk to America. The tripartite free trade area, SADAC, Commerce, and East African Committee together, 630 million people. Potential GDP, 1.3. Now we are discussing your projects, your products, your businesses with a ma larger market in access. You can then negotiate with the BRICS. You can then talk to China, not as South Africa, but as SADAC, as the FTA area. Why am I saying this? Look at those economies. China, 1.3 billion people, GDP, $11 trillion. That's an economy. India, 1.2 billion people, GDP, $2.5 trillion. That's an economy. The U.S., 325 million people, GDP, $19 trillion. Shame on you, Malawi. Shame on you, Zimbabwe. <laughs> you are not an economy. You are a little village. <laughs> South Africa, you are not a brick. Unless you go to the BRICS as SADAC, as COMESA, as the FTA, you don't belong to the BRICS. Those are the numbers. Look at our potential as Africans. The African continental free trade area. 1.3 billion Africans. GDP, $2.3 trillion. Now we are discussing. Can you imagine if we had to go and say, here I come, Madam China. Here I come, Madam India. I'm the African. I speak on behalf of 1.3 billion Africans. I have a GDP of $2.3 trillion. Can we talk? They will talk to you, not out of love, out of economics. <laughs> Here I come. I present a market of 1.3 billion Africans. I have a GDP behind me of $2.3 trillion. Can we discuss? They will entertain you. The Americans, the Chinese, the Indians, who fellowship with you, not out of love. <laughs> Part of economics. This is where we need to get to. Now, yes, due to that, I have no comment. I will expect more from you, my dear kings and queens. What is your opinion from what Professor he said? He said many things about engineers, and of course, uh, you know, in the continent of Africa, you see educated people are being ruled by non educated, and we see engineers, scientists, they feel inferior in front of uh, politicians or on other leaders, even the leaders, they have low qualifications, but because they speak to, uh, they are more talkative, but you see how we feel inferior. But this is one of the encouragement from professor that we need even our engineers to take uh, leadership. To, because uh, if you are an engineer and you become a leader, you understand how to solve challenges in engineering sectors. Uh, because this time the world needs engineers, need uh, science, need technologies. So we need scientists and technologists, experts, to lead this uh, continent. Politicians have been leading this continent for too long and we know what they have done so let us now allow engineers and of course the engineers they have to uplift themselves so don't think uh, there are someone who will come and give you power the power is always being taken so we need uh, to see how we can come together of course what all these things comes in is about the unit is about coming together is about thinking about the continent so let me hear from you, from what Professor 
Say thank you.